Does your birth year start with a 1-9 or a 2-0? Based on my channel's viewership data, I'm gonna go ahead and guess the former, so congratulations. You are officially too old to game. Video over, video over, cut, cut. cut. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe not too old to game at all, but according to a 2014 study out of Simon Fraser University on cognitive motor decline titled Over the Hill at 24, you are already physically on the way out. Better uh, pack up those esports dreams right now. In this essay, I'd like to explore not only the physical aspects that affect our gaming habits as we age, but also the social, mental, environmental, and perceptional changes that crash into the various stages of our lives altering, well, pretty much everything in regards to our gaming experience. Today, I seek to answer this question. Are you too old for video games? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I used to play a shitload of video games, like a lot. The 90s and the early 2000s were my prime gaming years, and I probably played 70% of the games I've ever played in that time period. As I've just recently aged out of the demographic of 18 to 35, it has me thinking a lot about the value and the veracity in which I game in my life. As I analyzed my personal playing habits throughout the years, looking back into the cartridge slots and disc trays of consoles long forgotten, I realized I was absolutely a fiend for gaming. In other forms of illicit consumption, uh, you might refer to me as an addict. And not only would I play any game I could get my hands on, I would often play them multiple times. Like, I finished Final Fantasy Tactics for the third time and started up again, excited to try a totally different group of classes and to figure out more ways to break the game. I'm pretty sure I've killed Dracula in the Upside Down Castle at at least a dozen times, but around the time I could legally start to drink, things started to change. My gaming habits fell down a rapid slope and eventually off the proverbial cliff, only to experience a renaissance in my very late 20s after a certain FromSoft game called it back from the proverbial uh, hunter-shaped grave. Now I'd like to ask you to take a second and consider this. What even is a gamer? Now, close your eyes, think of your answer, now open them back up and comment below the profile of who you envisioned. Do you fit or do you break that mold? Now whatever you thought, some of the actual facts may be pretty surprising. According to a 2016 report from the Entertainment Software Association, the average age of game players is currently 35 years old. Furthermore, only 27% of game players are under 18 years old, 29 are 18 to 35, 18% are 36 to 49, and 26% are 50 plus, 50 years and older. So now just wait a minute. There are more 50 year olds playing than 36 to 49 year olds. Over a quarter of active gamers are in their 50s or above. How the heck is that even possible? Now one thing can be certain for almost all of us. As we age, the frequency of which we game changes dramatically. Remember when I said I would beat a game three, four, hell, 10 times? Sometimes I struggle to finish a game that I really love even once. I have a nine to five, a partner, a dog and two cats, groceries to shop for and cook, a household to maintain, workouts, and making just enough time for the odd friend. Sound familiar? But back in the day, man, I feel like so many of us can relate to those formative summer months, spending all of our downtime in the house, duking it out with siblings on who gets to play the next chunk on the console of your choice. That next issue of PSM or Nintendo Power couldn't come in the mail soon enough just to find out which game on the horizon would be next to give you that fix. Even with a full Rolodex of friends on call and just a few bike strokes away, Many of us couldn't wait to enter new worlds that only our controllers and joypads could take us to. This chart, according to a 2017 study from the University of Halifax, Nova Scotia, shows a sobering fact that I'm sure all of us understand deep in our damn souls. Gaming with friends, siblings, and even family tends to go the way of the dodo almost entirely as we age. Time with our spouses and partners can be seen spent with games as we have less responsibility, but once 40 hits, there's a massive spike in gaming with children in the middle age, and 
I would posit that this is where gaming shifts most heavily for many. Now look at that bar for gaming with friends. Oh, just look at it, man. That percentage of time spent gaming with friends used to hover around 50 and 60% in early adulthood, but it's cut in more than half as we go into middle age and practically not even worth mentioning at 60 plus. I bet if this same survey was given to players under the age of 18, the number would be closer to 80 or 90%. Now, if there's one primary thing that holds many of us back from party-based multiplayer gaming, the latest fighting games and other cooperative games, it's just the fact that most of our friends have responsibilities with first names and that children bar is growing exponentially. As we age and build our own little communities with our own burgeoning families and small close-knit circle of friends, Getting together with the homies for some casuals and random gaming session falls almost entirely to the wayside. That's not even to mention the proximity effect of friends moving for jobs, to be closer to parents and grandparents to help with said children, and many other limiting life factors. And because of these changes, many of us begin to enter the nostalgia loop. <laughs> no, 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 that's not going and watching nostalgia episodes on my channel until you've seen them all. It's a real nostalgia loop. We have very limited time to interact with new games, so we tend to reach back into the games that remind us of a time where gaming satisfied us fully and all we had was time. The human brain is a fascinating machine, is it not? Bro, I cannot tell you how many fighting games I've tried to pick up in the past five to six years, be it Street Fighter V, Skullgirls, KOF 15, only to bounce off of them because I just don't have anyone to play with and I'm so out of practice from playing fighters in general against human beings that feels like it's not even worth trying. As these competitive games that require so much time and effort disappear from our lives, combined with the general effects of aging on our ability to perform within said games, begins to snowball and whether the chicken or the egg came first, they seem to only agitate one another until what is left of our gaming habit no longer resembles what it used to. The self-determination theory attempts to explain at least some of this. SDT is based around the notions of human motivation, development, and well-being, stating that humans have three intrinsic psychological needs that motivate their behaviors, competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Competence refers to our desire to feel effective whenever we face challenges. In the scenario where you stop playing fighting games with any consistency, lack of competence shows itself very quickly the second you get on the sticks. Now, anyone with some time on you working on their skill set is probably just gonna whoop your ass, and that can be so disheartening you don't come back for a long time or even at all. Strike one. Relatedness refers to our feeling of connectedness within the social context. Fighting games and cooperative games are as social as they get, but when life gets in the way for both parties to ever get together with any consistency to truly integrate, it becomes harder and harder to find that relatedness, to feel connected to your fellow player. It's like trying to be best friends with just an acquaintance. Strike two. Autonomy refers to the sense of control we have whenever taking a task on. The way we perceive that in the context of gaming is through choice. In the fighting game scenario, uh, you don't really have a choice in uh, you know, getting your ass destroyed three straight games in a set of five. So you tend towards games that do not conflict with your ability to make your own decisions and to feel in charge of that game world. Three strikes, you're out of here. And as we play less competitive games, have less competition in our lives, and don't have the same drive to outperform others that we once did, that must impact the type of games and our reasons for playing as we age, right? According to 2017 research out of the University of Saskatchewan, our motivations within the games we do play continues to change. As our age increases, our gaming choices can flip radically. Their findings noted, an increasing preference for casual and puzzle games and a declining preference for performance-related games, a decline in performance as a motivation to play, an increase in completion-focused player styles, and a decline in performance-focused player styles, a decline in the identification as a gamer, a decline in competence, which is partially explained by an accompanying decline in experienced intuitive control, i.e. 
a degrading of the mastery of control systems due to a lack of use or familiarity. Now that's a whole big word salad just to say the pattern that emerges suggests a shift away from performance and towards completion and an appreciation of choice and experience. Now the prevalence of puzzle games in older people shouldn't come as a surprise as our desire for direct competition wanes in our middle ages and beyond we have a tendency to lean deeper towards games that bring us more mental stimulation feelings of relatedness and less tactile stimulus and with factors such as growing families stresses competition in our careers as well as a downturn in time to devote to getting good at more execution heavy games Fitness, educational and casino style games join puzzle and strategy games as many older gamers preferred ways to unwind. I mean, who has time to get good at Call of Duty when little baby Timmy is crying again? Speaking of Timmy, the choice for which games to reach for is often taken out of the parents' hands entirely. Per the ESA in 2014, 42% of parents are playing games with their children, with the biggest reasons being it's fun for the family, it's a good opportunity to socialize with their kids, and, well, because they were asked to. Children playing games with their parents isn't just good for the parents. A study done in 2011 by Sion, Padilla Walker, Stockdale, and Day found that this act can lessen aggressive behavior and internalizing done by young adults. Now, if that's not reason enough to fire up Mortal Kombat with your preteen, shit. I don't know what is. And as the over 50 gamer has risen from 9% of gamers to 29%, coupled with game devs themselves continuing to get older on average, it's nice to see that there are more and more accessibility functions in even the most hardcore of games. The accessibility options in games like God of War, Horizon, and The Last of Us demonstrate a dedication of the industry to make sure that players of all ages and abilities can enjoy the pastime of gaming. Frankly, research into this topic is still super young, pun intended, and as the way we control games, the type of experience is possible and the gamer themselves continues to morph, it wouldn't surprise me if this video was outdated in less time than even my average video's obsolescence, which is to say, pretty fucking fast. Okay, so I know those of you with plus 24 in experience and beyond are wondering, yo, what the hell, game musician? Am I really getting too old for this shit? The article that inspired this video, Over the Hill at 24, did in fact find some interesting outcomes after observing league play in StarCraft II, with self-reporting showing over 545 hours on average of gameplay between all participants. The study measured players looking, doing latency or their ability to identify, respond, and react to visual stimuli across all leagues of play. And they all broke almost exactly the same. Whether it was bronze or platinum league, looking doing latency was relatively consistent from age 18 to 24. It was only after 24 did it start to rise for all players, linearly at that. And by 45, well, you're Basically toast. So next time you crush your dad in a game of Street Fighter 2, despite him swearing he's played it for 30 years now, maybe cut him a break, uh, cause you are quite literally built different. So stop gloating because when your nephew comes through and absolutely molly wops you in 20 years in Street Fighter 9, you might feel differently. And while this study indicated that there is a potential motor decline somewhere around our mid twenties, it points out that for most, this is such a gradual and minor slope that you probably won't even notice. I mean, shit, if I can still beat Sword Saint Ishin in my mid-30s, there's hope for us all. But just know, your gaming peak is probably behind you and uh, that's totally okay. Not all of us are cut out to be the next great esports player, but research also shows that there are so, so many benefits of playing games well beyond your 24th year. No, you are not too old for gaming. The beautiful thing about video gaming is that it can be an appropriate activity for people of all ages, all walks of life, and all ability throughout all genres. According to a 2018 study on the positive impact of gaming on how we age, there are so many positives 
in playing video games into our more advanced years that go well beyond the feeling of victory. Video games increase our cognitive functioning, reaction time, memory, attention span, and ability to multitask. Social games also allow older players to meet new friends, connect with their younger loved ones, and stay a part of a community well beyond more conventional methods. Narrative games give us a sense of choice and stimulate our imaginations regardless of how many rotations we've taken. Not to mention that games that use more hands-on tools with movement-based controls are a fantastic way to stay active. Now, maybe you don't get to sit around and play with your friends the way you used to. Maybe it has gotten a bit harder to keep up with the optional bosses in your favorite game, or maybe you even find your ability to pick up those previous games from 20 years ago to be just a frustrating foray into the past. But there are so many great contemporary games being made that account for all of that. Celeste is one of the hardest games I've played and beaten, but there are a medley of options that allow every gradient of player to enjoy it even if they don't feel like bashing their head against the wall for hours, just to experience the gripping narrative. And no, nobody is judging you for playing on easy. We're all adults here. Truly, with new accessibility choices for all levels of ability, gaming is more welcoming than ever. So go ahead and hit the couch, fire up some Tetris effect like myself, and never ever stop gaming. We are all gamers, whether it's for one hour or a hundred, and the research is right there. You're never too old to play. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Please keep it going in the comments down below and let me know how your gaming habits have changed. And do you see yourself playing video games 10 years from now, 20, 30? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Thanks again for watching. Much love, peace.